The Apostle John was there that day when a chance encounter by a well changed this woman's deepest desires. Her deepest desire had been, I just wish people wouldn't judge me. But as she leaves that well, her deepest desire has changed, that that God would use her past as a chance for her to share the good news of the Savior. It was a lifetime later, over 60 years, and John recorded it. And then he wrote to his spiritual children in 1 John, because they too had had this this encounter with the Messiah that had changed them. And he wanted to help them hold on to that deep relationship with the Savior. This is what he writes. He says, I am writing to you, dear children, because you, your sins have been forgiven on account, of my, uh, on account of his name. You've had this experience. You've been forgiven. You know it. I'm writing to you, fathers, because you know him who is from the beginning. You know that the Jesus who appeared is the eternal God who is there with the Father at the creation of the world. It is God who died for you. I am writing to you, young men, because... You have overcome the evil one. You have had this encounter that has given you strength to overcome Satan himself. And then like a poet, he repeats himself. I write to you, dear children, because you know the Father. You've had this encounter. I write to you, fathers, because you have known him who is from the beginning. I write to you, young men, because you are strong and the word of God lives in you and you have overcome the evil one. John's first readers in the, at the end of the first century had had the same kind of encounter with the Messiah that this woman had. And their deepest desires had changed. And Many of us here today are here because we have had that kind of deep encounter with the Savior. Many of you are watching. You're watching because I've had it. But maybe you're at that point in your life where you go, the passion, the excitement that that I saw in this woman's eyes, I don't have that anymore. And John is writing to the the first century Christians, and because the Holy Spirit has preserved this word for us, John is also writing to us 21st century Christians. And he's writing to warn us that we can lose that relationship with the Savior, that that deep desire that, that only Jesus matters. He goes on and says, do not love the world or anything in the world. If anyone loves the world, love for the Father is not in them. For everything in the world, the lust of the eyes, the lust of the the flesh, and the pride of life comes not from the Father, but from the world. The world and its desires pass away, but whoever does the will of God lives forever. The lust of the flesh the lust of the eyes, the pride of life, can drain out that excitement that we had at one time. And so John is writing to the first century Christians and to us to reclaim a deep desire for the Savior To go back and recognize that it is the Savior's deep desire for us that creates our deep desire for Him. 
Now, I'd like to change pictures from a, the, the, the first century well outside of a Samaritan village to a 21st century city. Do you recognize that building? It's the Burj Khalifa. It's the tallest building in the world. Now, I'm going to ask you three questions about the Burj Khalifa just to kind of acquaint you with this building. First of all, how tall is the Burj Khalifa? It's kind of like going to the baseball game and, you know, who of you says A? Who of you says B? Who of you says C? And the answer is C. 2,022 feet tall, more than half a mile up into the air. Amazing. Second question, true or false? The Burj Khalifa was built on top of the sand on a raft of concrete 12 feet thick. True or false? True. It's actually a trick question. It was built on a raft of concrete 12 feet thick, but Underneath that raft of concrete were 100, are 194 piles or, or pillars that go all the way down to bedrock. And those, those pillars that go down to bedrock, they are five feet in diameter and 141 feet tall to get all the way down to bedrock. You see, to build high, you have to go down deep, right? One last question. The Burj Khalifa is 2,722 feet high because Dubai is running out of land. True or false? You take a satellite picture and you go, there's all kinds of desert not very far away. You see, the Burj Khalifa, in my mind, is the ultimate example of the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. Why was the Burj Khalifa built 2,722 feet tall? Because the builders, the, the people who dreamed of it, wanted to make a name for themselves, for their city, for their emirate. You know, in so many ways, it's kind of like the pot tower of Babel today. And the reason why I talk about this is the Burj Khalifa is a picture of us. Even as Christians, we kind of like it when people focus their attention on us and look up to us. And the Burj Khalifa is a picture of that woman outside the Samaritan village. Because she too desperately desired the people around her to look up to her and respect her. And it cut her to the heart when they didn't. And when you are judged, what do you do? You build a raft on sand. I love the way the, the screenwriters of the, the Chosen depict what happens between Jesus and this woman. This woman feels judged by Jesus. She knows that, that she has failed. And so what do you do when you feel judged by others? The natural reaction is to build a raft on the sand of comparison. And that's what is depicted. You know, Jesus, you are guilty because it's people like you that put me down. It is people like you who don't let me get better in my life. It is your fault. See, you are the guilty one. So, 
Do you think this woman is the only one who does that? Who tries to make yourself feel better by making these comparisons? So Jesus does something surprising. Jesus hurts this woman. Did you see it? Go. Call your husband. Oh, yeah, you're right. You don't have a husband. You've had five, and now this guy isn't. Oh. You could see the pain in her eyes. Why is it that Jesus is, is hurting this woman? Because he's pulling out the sand underneath the raft, right? Pulling the sand out so that she recognizes that raft of comparison isn't a solid foundation for her life. It hurts. But he has to dig down deep for her to have an encounter with the Messiah that will go deep into her heart and be a life-changing encounter. The prophet Isaiah calls this God's alien task. And he has to do it for us too. You know, when I was younger and struggling to read through the Old Testament... I kind of looked at the Old Testament people like, man, what is wrong with these people? You know? God fed them with manna for 40 40 years. We just heard that, right? Feet didn't swell, right? 40 years? Come on! God gave you water from the rock. How could you not hold on to and trust in God? Gradually, it it dawned on me that I I was building my raft on the sand of comparison, too. You know, why does God record the sins and failures of his Old Testament people? Not so that we make comparisons, but so that he can use those examples to pull the sand out from under our raft. Here's just a couple of examples. Every inclination of a person's heart is evil from childhood. I loved using that, question, that passage uh, in, when I taught the, the new member Bible study. I just put it out there. You know, true or false? Every inclination of a person's heart is only evil from childhood. And almost everybody would say, false. That is way too dark and hopeless. And then, well, it's actually what God says in Genesis 8.21. Right? God wants to pull the sand out from underneath us too. He wants to dig down deep so that we realize we need something better as a foundation. The the heart is deceitful and beyond cure. Who can understand that the prophet screams out? But God's ultimate goal is not to hurt us. His ultimate goal is to dig out that sand so that we realize we need something better, a deeper foundation He wants us to see that 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 first century wording applies to us too. The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. It afflicts us. We see all the stuff around us, and that can so easily become the desire of our hearts rather than a desire for the eternal. And so he pulls the sand out. And then he reveals the bedrock deep down below. This passage was right in the middle of the hymn that we just sang, Amazing Grace. God's love for us is amazing. Let's read this verse together. This is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. Love isn't about comparison. 
Love isn't about, I love God more than you, or you love God more than me. Love is about God's love for us, and, and he digs way down deep to the foundation, the bedrock, that the one who is the atoning sacrifice for us is the Son of God himself. And that term, atoning sacrifice, it, it's meant to bring up all kinds of imagery from the Old Testament. To take you back to the great day of atonement in Leviticus 16, where the high priest would put his hands on the head of a goat and confess the sins of the people on that goat, and then that goat would be sacrificed. It would be the atoning sacrifice for, for the sins of the people. And then the priest would be able to take that blood into the most holy place and sprinkle it on the, the Ark of the Covenant, the mercy seat of God. Trouble is, it had to be repeated every year because it was just a picture. Jesus wants us to go down to the, the bedrock and, and recognize, you know, the one upon whom we transfer our guilt all the times we fail to love God, all the times we, we've judged others to make ourselves feel better, the, the, the sand of comparison, we compare it, confess it all upon him no matter what we've done or said. And the Son of God is, is a strong enough bedrock to hold us up. In John chapter 4, at the beginning of this section, he says, dear friends, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits. It's fascinating to, to, to read about the, the building of the Burj Khalifa, how, how much testing went into seeing, to make sure that, that that bedrock was strong enough to support this incredible building. Test the spirits. Test the Messiah just like this woman did to know that he is the, the strong bedrock. He goes on, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God. Because many false prophets have gone out into the world. This is how you can recognize the spirit of God. Every spirit that acknowledges that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God. But every spirit that does not acknowledge Jesus is not from God. This is the spirit of the Antichrist, which you've heard is coming and even now is already in the world. In John's day, what the devil was trying to do was pull out some of these supports. The false doctrine of John's day was that Jesus was a man, that the Christ, a, 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 a godlike being or part of God, comes into Jesus, but then the Christ leaves Jesus before he suffers and dies. So that it's, it's not God who dies for you. And John's gospel, John's letters, the revelation that Jesus received from John, you read through all of those over and over again. John is making clear that the one who died for us is that bedrock, God himself, the one who was with the Father from the beginning. The eternal God died for you, you can be certain. Today, oh, the devil uses lots of other ways to, to try to pull out some of those pillars and it's hard work to test the spirits you know I look at that and go you know, did you know that last night one of our members Linda came out and she showed me a picture on her on her phone that she had just been to the top of the Burj Khalifa you know would you go to the top of the Burj Khalifa if uh, the architects or the engineers said, you know what, it's just going to cost too much money. It's going to be too much work to put in 194 pillars. Why don't we just, why don't we just put in half as many? Or, or maybe a quarter. Would you still go to the top of the Burj Khalifa? I, I don't think so, right? I'm not so sure. The architect, the engineers, 
No, this is what is necessary to make sure the building is absolutely safe. Our Savior is the architect. And he knows all the piles, the foundation pillars that need to be in place to cement us, to connect us to the bedrock foundation. You know, today Satan is, is using questions about the six-day creation. Well, maybe you don't have to believe in the six-day creation. Or maybe you don't have to believe, you know, that, that, that what God says uh, about uh, uh, the sacraments, you know, the efficacy of the infant baptism. Or maybe you don't need to believe that, that Jesus' body and blood are present in the Lord's Supper. You know, whatever it is. Maybe you don't need to believe. Maybe it's just too hard to do all the work to test the spirits. Trust the architect who has designed the building of God's church. There is no doctrine of Scripture that is, oh, we can take it or leave it. And it is our call to study the Scripture so that, that we are convicted that Jesus is the bedrock and to be convinced and to be ready when Satan throws some false ideas our way that we know the Scriptures well enough to say, no, that's not right. It is hard work. But this is how God's church is kept safe. Because the biggest problem is not when our lives look like this. This is the way I want my life to be in service to God. I want God to build up the tower of my life in a marvelous way so that, that more and more people come to know the Savior through me. And if this is the way you are right now, it's like, ah, this is easy, this is great. But you know when you really need that strong foundation? It's when your building looks like this. This is right after the raft was built, and they just started building the Burj Khalifa on top of it. What if they stopped right there? What if God stops your building right there? You see, it's very often at that place in our lives, like the woman at the well, that God can best use us to draw the people around us to the Savior. Years ago, I learned a, a prayer to step into this pulpit and say, Lord, let you be everything and me be nothing. God, if you are glorified by, by you building me up and, and there's this marvelous building of my life, God be praised. Use it to glorify your name. But if your name is best glorified by me making a mess and a disaster of my life and my sermon, then your will be done. Because my deepest desire is not about me. It's about you. And the people who need to know you and to have a life-changing encounter with you, Lord. So let's search the Scriptures to be convicted. Let God's Word dig out the sand from underneath us that we're, we're basing our goodness in God's sight on. Let's search the Scriptures to be convinced, to know with certainty that there is this rock-solid foundation, and then let us search the Scriptures so that Jesus' deep desire becomes our deep desire. I mentioned that, that this woman's deep desire changed dramatically. 
She came out to the well at that place in her life where, where her deepest desire would be, I just wish people wouldn't know about all the, the, the sins, the mistakes of my past. The encounter with Christ changes her desires so that she doesn't care if anybody knows because what really matters is that they know the Savior who knows her fully. I'd like to close with the last little clip from that encounter at the well. I've asked Mike